a long, long, long road to building the tunnel at Double Slide on this episode of Pacific Currents. The idea of building a tunnel through Devil's Slide has, goes back at least 50 years. But the actual building of the tunnel involved an amazing uh, story of community involvement. And we're lucky this evening to have uh, two people who were involved in this project from the very beginning. So I'd like to welcome to the show uh, Zoe Kirstein Tucker. Nice to have you here. Thank you. And Mike Vasey. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So Zoe, I'd like to know very much how you got involved in this tunnel project. So I got involved in 1995 when the road went out in January. Um, my husband was commuting over the hill at that time and it, his commute went from about two hours a day to about four or five, wow. which was not very um, satisfactory to anyone, our family and many of others included. I went to Safeway in Happen Bay one day and there were some people standing outside providing some tabling uh, information about what Caltrans was intending to do in terms of the freeway bypass. And one of the things they were discussing was the fact that our county supervisors were not willing to ask Caltrans to look at alternatives to this massively destructive road. And I was really appalled by that, that our elected officials were essentially stonewalling the community. So that got me intrigued, got me more involved. And Mike, how about you? As a longtime resident in Pacifica, I was aware of uh, the bypass uh, controversy. And uh, when the slide went out in uh, early 1995, it became obvious that there was uh, a lot of uh, pressure to move forward with the bypass. And there was a lot of resentment at the time towards uh, the environmental activists who had managed to stop the bypass uh, back in the mid-1980s. So can you give us a quick history of this, uh, this whole tunnel idea? You have to go back and look at the history of the road itself. And, and the road actually is on top of a railroad, the old Ocean Shore Railroad, which was the early 1900s. And they then built a, a road that went up and over San Pedro Mountain, uh, which had its own problems. And so that as the railroad continued to fail, uh, they then decided to build the new Highway 1 over the old uh, railroad grade. And then, of course, as time went by, it began to fail as well. And then in the 50s, there was a plan really throughout the country to build lots of freeways and lots of highways to kind of accommodate lots of sprawl. And at that time, Ollie Mayer got involved. Uh, she's an engineer and with the Sierra Club, a, a great proponent of environmentalism. She loved the outdoors. And she looked at this plan for the bypass and went, oh my goodness, we can't have this. And she got... Uh, a number of people involved, including Lenny Roberts with the Committee for Green Foothills. So those two formed quite a powerful alliance starting way back in the early 60s. The purpose is to open development on the coast. That's what it's all about. It originally, um, Dolger owned it. He owned 10,000 acres and he worked with Caltrans to um, build a six-lane freeway to his property. And he planned to build a city of 160,000 people on the coast. Well. The, the, the environmentalists gave him a bad time, a bad time. And he, he ran running for cover, but a company named Dean and Dean took over. They only planned a city of 110,000, yeah. And they had condominiums all the way up the side of Montara Mountain in their plans, all the way up to the saddle. They had it all designed with roads and houses and condominiums, and they're gonna cut steps all the way up the side of the mountain. It was going to be a beautiful thing. And they planned a shopping center where, um, right next to Montara State Beach and a golf course on the cliffs there in Montara. Big golf course, country club. And that was going to be the gateway to the coast. And the coast the development was to be a, the biggest city in San Mateo County, 110,000 people. You see, it was proposed as a, a freeway 
extending from San Francisco to Point Conception in the south, a six-lane freeway. That was the original proposal. People heard about it. They found out what was going on. And in the counties to the south, they all decided, hey, we don't want that. Get that damn thing out of here. <laughs> so San Luis Obispo turned it down. Monterey turned it down. Santa Cruz County turned it around. San Francisco said, hell, we don't want all that traffic coming into the city. We don't want that thing. And Marin said, my god, if that's what they're going to do down there, think of what they'll try to do on Highway 1 up here and our Stinson Beach and along our cliffs. We don't want it either, so knock it out. But from Half Moon Bay into San Francisco, it's been designed and planned for a six-lane freeway. Well, you know if they ever get it to the south of Half Moon Bay, then it'll go further. As a matter of fact, if they ever get it over that mountain, graded for six lanes, sooner or later they'll build six lanes. It's graded for six lanes. It's to be paved for four lanes. It's to be striped for three lanes, and it's called a two-lane road. Isn't that wonderful? And why it's called a two-lane road? Because the State Coastal Act says that in rural areas, Coastal Route 1 shall remain a two-lane road. That's almost word for word, the way the law reads. That's the law. It will be um, environmentally disastrous, with uh, seven cuts over 150 feet deep, one 280 feet deep, one 220 feet deep. That's enormous. That's higher than the Golden Gate Bridge is over the, the bay. So those cuts and fills are going to slough off uh, dirt, and they're, uh, they're going to be a continual maintenance problem, worse than the Devil's Slide, and that's going to all go into the ocean and silt up the ocean. It'll destroy the San Pedro Creek, uh, Green Valley Creek, and, and Martini Creek. And uh, particularly San Pedro Creek will, will be ruined for fish forever. <laughs> Any fill over 200 feet high is considered extremely dangerous. And most designers will never build a fill over 200 feet high. So we have a couple of fills that are 250 feet high planned, and one was three, over 300. They finally cut it down because of our yelling about it so much. In the 1970s, a USGS geologist named Ken LaJoy, who lived in El Granada, thought it would be a great idea to have a tunnel. So he, he laid out these sketches and we sent them to Caltrans and asked them to consider a tunnel. 1983, when the highway went out, that's when it went out for 87 days and there was a lot of public pressure to do something, do something. So that's when they started writing the EIS. They had the first hearing in January 1984. And at that hearing, well over a thousand people turned out. We packed the Half Moon Bay High School. We had about, oh, about 40 or 50 people stayed there right straight through till, till 2.30 in the morning <laughs> and getting everything in the record. We did a remarkable job in analyzing that EIS and it didn't mean a damn thing. They didn't change, they didn't change anything. They paid no attention to any of the information we brought to them. It's hard to win legally and it's, it's hard to win scientifically. And the thing that moves them, moves the governments and moves these people are not facts, not knowledge, it's noise, it's political noise. So my advice to people is to get out there and scream. So we've just seen about um, Ollie's uh, involvement in this, but I'd like to know about Lenny Roberts because I know she was really instrumental is part of this whole process. So tell me about her. So Lenny and Ollie joined forces in the early 60s, and they were part of this larger movement of women who were extremely well-educated, intelligent, but who were housewives, who looked around and said, you know, there's a lot of this environment that really needs to be protected, and we, have some, we need some tools. Lenny's the Committee for Green Foothills. Other women started the Save Our Bay effort, the environmental volunteers. So. That's how Lenny and Ollie both got their start. Right around that time, in, in uh, 1970, the Coastal Initiative was passed. And this, this was a, a, another rallying point. This was a, something that was California-wide. People were really concerned about overdevelopment of the coast, loss of, of the quality of the environment of the coast, and access to the coast. Clearly, the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s were a time when people were really environmentally conscious 
and uh, there was a lot of community activism going on. Right, they're time. beginning to be environmentally yeah. conscious Absolutely. and learning that they needed powerful tools to battle the development efforts. So I think we have a clip now about what uh, Lenny was doing during this time. It all began after World War II when uh, our state, just as the rest of the country, was thinking about expanding and economic growth everywhere. And Caltrans was a natural part of all of that because you have to have freeways to connect the suburban future residents to wherever they're going to go to work. So Caltrans started planning a massive highway system including a freeway down the coast. If we had followed that, we would have had Los Angeles from Daly City down to Santa Cruz uh, on our coast. Hi, I'm Lenny Roberts. I'm the San Mateo County Legislative Advocate for the Committee for Green Foothills, and I've done this job for over 30 years. There was a reaction to all of this grandiose planning of the state and Caltrans. Uh, people, especially in the Bay Area, started to revolt against freeways, and part of it began in San Francisco, and was called the Freeway Revolt, where San Francisco refused to have freeways slashing through their neighborhoods. Wait a minute, we don't want to urbanize the coast side. We don't want to have 100,000 people around Half Moon Bay. Uh, we, we think there's a different future for the coast. And our coast, which is an agricultural amenity for the whole Bay Area, should remain rural. I got involved in this issue when I was on the board of the Committee for Green Foothills in 1972. And our organization was very concerned about the plans that were being proposed by a major landowner, Dean and Dean and then Westinghouse Corporation, to develop 8,000 acres of land around Half Moon Bay and the Midcoast uh, with we, what we thought was inappropriate, sprawling development that did not respect the sensitivity of the land. This was one of the early challenges to a project that was going to use federal dollars. Caltrans had said that it's a state highway and a state project, so they did not have to comply with NEPA. And we argued that it used federal dollars, and anything that used federal dollars would have to comply. And the court agreed with us. Norm Kelly, who was Caltrans District 4 director under Governor Jerry Brown, proposed what became known as the Marine Disposal Alternative. Almost immediately after Norm began the process of studying the Marine Disposal Alternative, uh, Jerry Brown was no longer governor, and we had a new governor, George Duke Majin, who replaced Norm Kelly immediately with the freeway building engineers that had been in place in the 50s and the 60s. Now we have the freeway designers back in charge at Caltrans and they're studying alternatives for the Devil Slide area and their conclusion was when they finally did their environmental impact report and environmental impact statement, both of those, um, that the marine disposal alternative was too expensive and their preferred project was the Devil Slide bypass. At that point the Sierra Club and the Committee for Green Foothills and other organizations went to court again to stop the bypass. People spoke and we have now created a project that we like to call the People's Tunnel because it was people that made this tunnel happen. So instead of having uh, just a continuous suburban sprawl pattern on the coast side, we've protected the agricultural lands and the open space. And we have a firm boundary around the urban area that will continue to allow development to occur within that urban boundary. Can you explain to our viewers uh, the, the bigger picture, the broader political context uh, uh, where this was, uh, what was happening you know, at the state level? We had a new administration under Governor Duke Majin. Things really clamped down. And um, that was the time when the, de the bypass was really pushed uh, through the political process, almost made it. 
here in Pacifica, just as an example, we had a city council. At that time, there were two proposals that surfaced, uh, the Devil Slide Bypass and this option of dumping tons of sediment into the ocean and creating a, the so-called marine disposal alternative. Neither option was very appealing to a lot of people. And one of our council members here in Pacifica, in fact, Peter Loeb, um, he refused to take a position on either option. And his reason was he didn't like either option. He thought either option was terrible. There had been so much clashing over the previous couple of decades over this road. And the environmentalists had fought tooth and nail to oppose the bypass. But that was really frustrating. Many members of the community who were, their businesses were suffering. They were sitting in their cars for hours and they're going, look, we just want this thing fixed. So many of us who came at it from an envir environmental perspective were like, okay, we really have to reframe the issue. We really have to do a better job of making this a broader issue. And that was kind of the zeitgeist of, of 1995 and 96. Ted Lampert and Ruben Barales, who are our champions on the Board of Supervisors, pulled together a blue ribbon panel to take a look at what are some of our options here. And these geologists and engineers said, well, we think a tunnel is an option. That's something that should be on the table. You know, it was Tor Brecky and Doug Hamilton and Ralph Trapani with the Department of uh, uh, Transportation in Colorado that had just finished the Eisenhower Tunnel on I-70. Uh, that, that really added a professional credibility to this. The engineering expertise to not just be wishfully thinking that there was an alternative, but to say there's a, there's a real concrete alternative and it can be state of the art and it can, it can be a win for everyone. Hi, I'm Chris Tholog. I was chair of the Devil Slide Task Force for the Sierra Club and a member of the steering committee for Measure T, the tunnel initiative. And I'm Peter Dreckmeyer. I was a campaign coordinator for the Sierra Club Devil Slide campaign, and I did a lot of community organizing here on the coast. So Ted Lampert went to Caltrans and said, hey, can you send us any information you have on studying the tunnel? I've heard that you've looked into it before. What do you have? I'd like to see it. And Caltrans said, well, we're not going to give you anything unless there's an official request from the Board of Supervisors. So Ted and Ruben went back to the full board and tried to pass a resolution to ask for information about the tunnel. The other three supervisors denied it. They just wanted to get on with a solution. They wanted to build the bypass. So you saw great leadership from two, but we needed one more. We decided that uh, with the lawsuits wrapping up that it was really going to take a political solution to deal with Devil's Slide. There was a real widespread uh, belief that Caltrans uh, had drug its feet in reopening the road and uh, the closure I think ran about six months. We talked to contractors who'd, who'd worked on road repairs in uh, Marin County and they told us this road could have been opened in as little as six weeks rather than six months. So it, it was just an interesting lesson in unintended consequences because unless we galvanized into that kind of dedicated core of really committed grassroots activists uh, we couldn't have been successful at the signature gathering, uh, which was the next necessary step for uh, Measure T. There were local people concerned about road reliability, uh, the economics, the business community was concerned about a reliable road. There was a lot of concern about safety, uh, the, the fog on the road, uh, and uh, I think that we had to, as we, as we built the campaign, have different faces that represented those different constituencies. And so there was a, a group here on the mid-coast, Citizens for the Tunnel, and Pacifica, there was Pacifica Tunnel Alternative for Highway 1, and focusing on sooner, safer, cheaper. Environment wasn't even in, the, in that message. I mean, they cared about the environment. They wanted to protect Montera Mountain. They wanted to keep the coast side from being overrun with development, but really catering to people who might be on the fence, who might be thinking a little bit more about the cost of the project, about the safety, and we had such a well-rounded group, we had a representative to speak to any, any organization that wanted to hear from us. Uh, a study that we commissioned a, uh, uh, by Brian Godby to, to look at the viability of a tunnel alternative, whether or not a tunnel uh, 
initiative could pass. And what they identified was the multiple constituencies that none by itself was adequate to prevail. But the, being on message with, with each of these groups and combining it and addressing all of their concerns, that, that we could actually win a tunnel initiative. One really interesting thing from that poll was if you said the tunnel is good for the environment, that pulled higher than if you added up because it will save Montero Mountain or because it will protect the coast side. So in a way, the environment was a better sell than the specifics, but the other issues of safety and cost and the expediency of it really played well. We had to underscore, because this was a countywide initiative, that the benefits were to everyone in the county. And as Ollie repeatedly said, it's a national resource. The messaging for the initiative uh, really talked about the, the majority of San Mateo County voters that didn't live on the coast, but found a, a, a use and an ability to come over and, and uh, relax and enjoy nature and, and balance the stress in their lives by, by visiting the coast and visiting Montero Mountain. We actually, countywide, we got 74% of the vote, but in Half Moon Bay it was only 55%. So this really is a, a county treasure, a state treasure, a national treasure. The Devil Slide campaign was the first time that I know about that we really used email communication. And it was incredibly helpful because we could share documents, we could communicate from Montero to Pacifica easily. You could involve a whole group of people all at once. And it was a way of basically having meetings in a world where it was very difficult to get back and forth. So I think that was the beginning of, of modern day activism, really using the internet and using email. It was a way we could communicate really quickly. We could get people to turn out for hearings. We could give them talking points. We could collaborate on letters, on editorials. Great way to share information. Shows that cooperation can really pay off. Well, I know there are a lot of legal issues involved in this, and we have a clip now of Mary Beth Halloran and her involvement in the legal part of the story. I got into this because Ollie Mayer called me and talked to me about this highway that was 100 feet wide that was being proposed from south of Pacifica to north of Half Moon Bay. I had known Ollie because I had become involved in coastal resource protection. The uh, California Coastal Act had just passed. I had just come to the West Coast from the East Coast where I had practiced and I was intrigued by um, California's effort to protect the resources for future generations. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Halloran. I was lead counsel for Sierra Club and other coastal groups in the Devil Side matter. The first action that was taken was to stop the progress of the initial adopted alignment, which the Sierra Club did in 1972 by bringing an action in federal district court to force Caltrans to comply with the newly passed National Environmental Protection Act. The environmentalists who lived along the coast knew that there were substantial impacts and they hadn't been fairly measured. There was a visual impact, there were noise impacts from bringing all of that traffic to the uh, coastal resources. There, of course, was a huge impact on uh, McNee Ranch State Park. Uh, this was going to create a giant cut in the saddle. It would disrupt the uh, hiking, it would disrupt the enjoyment of the park. Ali um, and Lenny explained that what we needed to do was have a team of people look at everything. The ultimate thing was a legal opinion, but we have to understand that there were stacks and stacks of documents. Just analyzing the noise impact required somebody to look at the raw data, the test uh, results that had, was that it came from the instruments that had been placed on Montara Mountain to try to gauge the existing ambient noise. Everybody, somebody had to look at all of that and try to put it together and understand what really was measured and whether there was an accurate measurement uh, that uh, we could use to argue that there was going to be a substantial noise impact. We talked to the experts who Caltrans had used in gathering their data and in the process we found documentation substantiation 
of the impacts that were going to occur. So ultimately, Judge Peckham issued his order agreeing with us. Caltrans had analyzed the environmental impacts in an inadequate way, and he ordered them to do a better job. And he stayed approval of the project until they complied with the federal law. It became obvious that the Board of Supervisors were not going to uh, support the tunnel alternative. And we made the fateful decision at that point in time to uh, uh, essentially go the route of a, of a, of a measure, uh, to develop a campaign, craft the language, and to, uh, along with so many amazing volunteers at the point like Marty Kingsall. My involvement in the Devil Slide campaign started with a meeting in Pacifica that involved Caltrans and the Sierra Club. And Caltrans did not show up to the meeting. And I started digging deeper into the whole Devil Slide issue. And there was enough evidence that I needed to be involved. Hi, my name is Marty Kingshill. I was the volunteer signature coordinator for the Measure T campaign. And I also collected 2,000 signatures. I grew up in Pacifica. My family moved here in 1955. It was a great place to grow up, and I'm very proud to say that I'm from Pacifica. We started our campaign on the coast side and moved it to the San Mateo County Bay side, and many of our locations were Safeway shopping centers and also Sawyer Camp Trail over by Crystal Springs Reservoir. The materials that we used during the campaign generally consisted of a model, we had many graphics that we used. We had um, buttons and we also had bumper stickers. The bumper sticker that was the most effective was the Think Tunnel bumper sticker. We literally gave out thousands of these bumper stickers throughout the county and throughout the United States and the world. We would go out on Saturday and Sunday mornings to collect signatures and had people out generally for four to five hours a day. On Sunday afternoon, I would bring the signatures to John Lynch, who would go through all the signatures. He had the, the register of voters polls for San Mateo County and check every signature to make sure they were valid. As a result, San Mateo County counted very few signatures because they were so good. When we first started tabling, the Measure T campaign did not have a tremendous amount of support. As we kept going and people started to see all the different information we had, they started to realize that this was a preferred alternative to the bypass. One of our big challenges in collecting signatures is we had very little support from politicians. We had two people from the Board of Supervisors who supported us, and that was all at that point. So Measure T1 collecting 74% of the votes in San Mateo County. After my community involvement with the Measure T campaign, I became involved with Midcoast Parklands in El Granada. And we ran a community park for 15 years, which was just recently donated to the San Mateo County Parks Department. Caltrans, to that point, had continued to tell us that a tunnel was not feasible, couldn't be done. And then, bam, Mitch finds this memo that says, yes, it can. So who is Mitch? He was absolutely right from the, from the get-go opposed to the Devil Slide bypass. When Devil Slide went out in, in 95 for six months, it really separated our communities. But when we realized that there was a possible solution, a, a, a tunnel alternative, a grassroots effort built out of that and brought our communities back together to make this project happen. Hi, I'm Mitch Reed. I'm with Citizens Alliance for the Tunnel Solution. Two of the uh, County Board of Supervisors, Ted Lempert and Ruben Borales, brought a, uh, some geotechnical engineers out to Devil's Slide and asked them if there was an alternative solution or a permanent repair that they would be better. And they asked, well, has anybody thought about doing a tunnel? And they said, yes, we researched it and decided that it was not a feasible thing. And the supervisors then said, well, we'd like to see these documents. And they said, well, you have to take a formal vote to have these documents sent to you. But unfortunately, three of the supervisors were not in favor of having this uh, information released to the public. And so they voted and, and nothing happened on that day. I came out of that meeting uh, very frustrated that they 
did not want to release these public documents. So I, later that day, I filed a Freedom of Information Act re request to Caltrans, and they released some documents to me. To me. Several of these pages I read had re referred back to other documents, and I said, well, where are these documents? And they said, okay, well, we'll send you a few more pages, and, the, and, uh, and once they sent these pages over, I realized that one of these documents was really a smoking gun. It was what was called the Roberts Memo. This document stated very clearly that if the purpose of the project is to bypass Devil's Slide, then a tunnel should be chosen. We went to the city council here in Pacifica and requested that they formally request Caltrans do a tunnel study. Caltrans responded by saying, yeah, we'll look at a tunnel again and we'll say it's too expensive. And clearly they had a bias, so we went to Federal Highways and requested that they do a study, and they responded with a $1.7 million tunnel study. Not only had Caltrans studied a tunnel many years earlier, but they had deemed it feasible and cost-effective. That was it. That was like throwing gasoline on the fire. The campaign was raging throughout the county. So now Measure T has passed, and everybody's on board. Caltrans is now on board on building the tunnel and now they have to design the tunnel. So now we're going to find out from the engineers how they plan this tunnel. Hi, I'm Dan Zerga, Regional Engineering Manager of the ILF Consulting Group right here in Oakland. And I'm Zuzana Skovaisova, Senior Tunnel Engineer with ILF Consultants. Devil Slide Tunnel is approximately 4,300 feet long, just under a mile. There's two tunnels. The Roadway from Highway 1 crosses over a bridge at Shamrock Ranch and enters into the North Block, extends through the mountain with a beautiful view as you come out the south end. Devil's Slide Tunnel is a drain tunnel, so we waterproof the lining of the tunnel so all the formation water runs into drains that drain to the south, so it's a completely dry tunnel. The size of the opening, it's horseshoe in shape. Uh, it's about 30 feet wide, about 28 feet high. Within the tunnel are two sidewalks, an emergency shoulder, one lane each, both northbound and southbound. And there are signages for access to the cross passages in case of emergency. And we have ventilation system consists of uh, jet fans. There are eight sets of two in each tunnel, and these fans will be uh, turned on in case of a fire to reverse the flow of smoke away from uh, passengers in their cars. Out of view of Highway 1 is the OMC building operation and maintenance center, which will facilitate and support uh, the tunnel during its operation. The Devil's Light Tunnel has been designed based on the new Austrian uh, tunneling method principles, which is called all over the world different ways. It's a sequential excavation method or uh, observation method. The principle uh, is basically you build the support based on uh, ground behavior which is encountered in the, in the field. Uh, we developed five different support categories based on the different ground behaviors. The, uh, category 1 is for a most competent ground and uh, category 5 is for uh, weak zones and uh, fault zones. What is the difference between uh, these uh, categories is the type of support we are using, advanced land and the way they were excavated. For example, category 1 has been excavated with the drill and blast method. We had the longest advanced uh, land in this category and as well we used uh, fewer rock dowels to support the opening. For um, heavier categories, uh, we used uh, shotcrete uh, support as a main support of the opening. As a pre-support for um, very weak ground, we used the spiles and drilled pipes. Uh, let me describe the mountain a little bit. It's fairly complex. We've broken it down into three blocks, south block, central block, and north block. South block is fairly competent, granodiorite. Central block 
would be our moderate ground where we have conglomerate and sandstone. And then the north block, which is the small block at the very end, it's a very weak section, uh, shear zone, uh, essentially big blocks floating in gouge material. Uh, this was the area we expected to have the most difficulties. Because of this complex geology, the NATM determined as the most suitable excavation method for the Devil's Light Tunnel. We in ILF has lots of experience with this type of method as our company is based in Europe. Most of the European tunnels through the Alps been built and excavated with new Austrian tunneling method. We don't prescribe in our design how the tunnel is to be built. We just, we just tell them what the ground conditions are and then they come up with how they want to excavate it. But typically in the competent ground, you would use a drill and blast technique. When you get into the moderate ground, if you can use a road header, that is a preferred approach. In the class five, the worst ground, you have to provide support ahead of the face. It's important that as you advance, you don't have this rattling rock coming down into your excavation. We drill in long pieces of rebar called spiles and these reach out way in front of the excavation. If the ground's really bad, we even put in larger diameter, closely spaced pipes that provide additional support. So one of the really lovely things about this whole tunnel construction process is that from the very beginning, Caltrans convened a design aesthetics committee. It was comprised of citizens from both north and south of Devil's Slide. And the idea was to make sure that this tunnel reflected, you know, the aesthetics were important, that are important to us here on the coast. There was a tremendous amount of public input around how those portals would look. Oh. Tremendous amount of public input on how the, you know, the texturing would be colored on the retaining walls. So Caltrans really did an extraordinary job of including the community. By the time Measure T passed and we were pretty much committed to a tunnel. There was a time when everybody was really kind of, I won't say burnt out, but it had been a long, long struggle. And Caltrans wanted to, to use a, 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 basically a fill over the ravine uh, in the north portal to, uh, as the access. And it would have filled a, a frog pond. Everybody by that time was just fatigued. Mitch would not let it happen. After Measure T passed, Caltrans started drawing up plans for the, uh, for the tunnel. One of the major issues they had to deal with was the California red-legged frogs. They're located in a pond right directly behind me here. They had originally proposed filling in this entire valley with dirt so they could get the road across to the portals. Uh, there was a lot of support for this because it was an, a cheap option. The other option was to build this bridge at a cost of about $12 million more. During that period, uh, I broke ranks with my colleagues and was a lone advocate for this bridge. Mainly, it would have uh, devastated the ranch here. And most importantly, had they uh, allowed uh, these frogs to be relocated, it would have set a uh, dangerous precedent of uh, uh, relocating endangered species for a project. I've been on the Devil's Slide Task Force uh, since passage of Measure T. Uh, many of us felt there still needed to be citizen involvement in this project uh, because it's more than just protecting the frogs, it's, it's protecting Montero Mountain. There was a feedback from the community. Uh, they, they were concerned about uh, Caltrans plans. We looked at the different options, we scaled them down, but still uh, the community felt that uh, we could do a better job. There was a uh, discussion about uh, other alternatives that would minimize the impact, including the construction of a tunnel. Caltrans looked at those uh, options but considered them to be unfeasible at the time. Hello, my name is Stefan Galvez and I'm the Office Chief for the Office of Environmental Analysis in Caltrans District 4 in Oakland. I've been involved in the Devil's Slide project for the last 15 years. My role in the project is insurance environmental compliance and coordinating with the agencies for environmental issues. Uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, and CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, came into being uh, also in late 1960s and early 1970s. The community also um, challenged Caltrans to actually 
uh, live up to uh, the requirements of uh, the law. So we looked at the different options. In the mid-90s, the community uh, felt very strongly about uh, the construction of the tunnel and they placed on the ballot uh, measure for San Mateo County, what was called Measure T. With that in mind, Caltrans started looking at uh, the construction of the tunnel. The previous alignments resulted in a significant number of environmental impacts. Uh, the new alignment going through uh, San Pedro Mountain via tunnel pretty much avoided a large majority of those impacts. So as you know, this area is beautiful. It is breathtaking when people are out there. They just, just love this area. One of the challenges that we had at the time was to make sure that uh, our project did not cause some of the impacts that uh, the community um, were concerned about with the previous alignments, which uh, in part were uh, the impact, the visual impacts uh, on these scenic resources. Obviously, by building a tunnel, you avoid the great majority of the impacts, um, but there was still concern about landform alteration and uh, basically minimizing the footprint out there and also blending in the development that we had with uh, the topography and uh, the geology of the area. The bridges coming out of the North Portal over Shamrock Ranch, they're beautifully designed to mimic the topography with arches. So that adds aesthetic value to the area. We also specifically design uh, handrails that mimic uh, the arches of the bridge. Also, we wanted to make sure that we um, were consistent with the geology uh, of the area. So on the tunnel portals, we attempted to mimic the rock formations. So when you go out there and you see it, it appears that is uh, basically the, the natural rock. So one of our goals is to protect and enhance the environment while we safeguard the, the safety of the traveling public. We build a bridge over uh, the north pond of Shamrock Ranch, and this pond uh, is breeding habitat for the red-legged frog. The red-legged frog is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. In our coordination with the agencies, uh, it was really key that we avoided uh, the impacts uh, to, to the red-legged frog and their habitat. So in addition to all the measures that we undertook to avoid and minimize impact on the species and their habitat, we also trained all the workers on site and all Caltrans staff to ensure that we have uh, further minimized the potential impact to the species. So we're looking for a third party to take over the long-term management and responsibility for, for the ponds and the conservation easements, and Caltrans is actively working with several parties uh, to do that and to actually fund that effort. We will relinquish Highway 1. Um, it's about 1.2 mile long segment. So once we build the tunnel, existing Highway 1 will remain hugging the coast. And that portion will be turned over to San Mateo County. But prior to doing that, Caltrans is going to improve the area to create a public access. We will be building two cul-de-sacs at the end of the existing Highway 1, a portion connecting those two cul-de-sacs will be available for use by the general public. It's going to be non-motorized use. It's going to provide expansive views of the ocean. They're breathtaking. Together with the Pacifica Trail, we're going to have a network of public access. We had a number of uh, agencies that have jurisdiction over this area, San Mateo County, the Coastal Commission, Fish and Wildlife Service, Fish and Game, Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board, and obviously the community. And now we have a project that we're all very proud of and really satisfied with. So not only do we get a new tunnel, but we get a trail for bikers and hikers. It's the best part of the story, right? It's a great part of the story. And it's also a great part from the perspective that, you know, we, we really believed that this would be in the best interest of the community. And, and this just is the icing on the cake because this truly will open up uh, uh, the coast and this whole region for recreation by so many people for so long. It's really going to make, uh, I think, the economy of our, our community soar. And it's just so much in the best interest of, of uh, the future of, of our region. You know, Mike, I used to think, build it and they will come. And it sent a shiver down my spine because I thought that meant thousands of homes. Now I know it means lots and lots of people 
to enjoy the trails and the natural resources here. So. Exactly. There are not a lot of places along the California coast where you can actually walk along these majestic cliffs like this, and it's, it's going to attract people not only from our community, but from all over the state, I'm thinking. All over the all, world. All over the world. The world. And it's going to link up. There's uh, with Rancho Corral de Tierra down south now with the, the park. And if we can open up uh, the, the trail system around both Pacifica and down the coast, it, it's going to be a, a, a global, uh, you know, attraction. Now the groundbreaking happened when? The groundbreaking happened in 2005. And then the punch through came in? In 2010. So five years to actually build a tunnel. And now it's open. Yay! Hallelujah! <laughs> Power to the people, that's all I yep, have to say. <laughs> absolutely. So after all this time, uh, all your work finally paid off, and you must feel really excited now to see the tunnel open. Well, I, I personally, I'm thrilled. I, I, I think it's, it's so huge uh, f for the coast and, and in the long term for the, the, the you know, environmental health, the ecology of the coast, as well as it, it just works on so many levels that, yeah, it's inspiring. Restores my faith in democracy. It does. You know, I, I want to thank both of you for your efforts to uh, help make this happen. And uh, I can't wait to take my daughter through the tunnel for the first time. I'm sure you're going to take your family through the tunnel as soon as you can. Yeah, me too. I can't wait. So thanks again for appearing on Pacific Currents. And folks, you can always catch our uh, Pacific Current show on YouTube. Thanks very much for joining us. Good night.